Hey guys, Carlson here to finish up chapter 18 with you. We're going to pick up uh, where we left off with section 5, where we leave the kidneys and now talk about the urinary tract. So, filtration, modification, and urine production all end when fluid enters the renal pelvis. And basically, the urine is now going to be transported, stored, and eliminated by the structures of the urinary tract, which are the ureters, the urinary bladder, and the urethra, and the urine is going to travel in that order. So the ureters are a pair of muscular tubes and you can see them right here. They take the urine from the kidneys to the bladder and they're about 30 centimeters long. Uh, they attach at the posterior wall of the bladder and where the openings are, uh, they are called the ureteral openings and they're actually slits more than a hole. And about every 30 seconds, peristaltic contractions begin at the renal pelvis or the start of the ureters and sweep across the ureters to force urine uh, towards the bladder to fill it up. Uh, solids composed of calcium deposits, magnesium, salt, or uric acid crystals can form here. Uh, this will result in a condition known as nephrolithiasis and would form what we know as kidney stones, but they are normally called calculi uh, scientifically. Uh, this is a situation that where normally you can uh, eliminate the kidney stones through urination, which is very painful, or sometimes in bad enough cases they would need to be removed. The bladder now is this hollow muscular organ. It stores urine prior to micturition. A full bladder can fill up to one liter of urine. However, we generally speaking, we, we usually expel urine prior to that. It lies in the pelvic cavity and the area surrounding the urethral entrance, which is right here, uh, is known as a neck. And it contains an internal urethral sphincter. See, he's pointing to that right here. And that is the involuntary control area of urine discharge. Uh, there's strat stratified squamous that actually line uh, the bladder itself and that allows for distension or basically expanding of the bladder as it fills up. And then this middle layer here um, is smooth muscle and it's that detrusor muscle that is going to contract and expel or help those urine contents expel into the urethra. So the urethra the urethra itself extends from the neck of the bladder uh, to the exterior of the body. Uh, it passes through the muscular floor of the pelvic cavity to form a circular band of skeletal muscle, which is right here, and that is called your external urethral sphincter. Uh, that is your voluntary control area for urination. Now, urination occurs, or micturition, occurs due to a reflex. And this reflex controls the peristaltic contractions of the ureters to move urine into the urinary bladder. Uh, these are the basic steps. Uh, basically, what, as the bladder fills, stretch receptors in the wall of the bladder are stimulated. And um, each increase in volume of urine is going to lead to an increase in stimulation. And afferent sensory fibers in the pelvic nerves carry the impulse to the sacral part of the spinal cord. Uh, stimulation of interneurons will relay sensations to the thalamus, and then projection fibers will lead that message to the cerebral cortex. We then would have a conscious awareness of fluid pressure or the need to urinate. Um, this urge usually happens at about 200 milliliters filled. If the volume would to exceed 500 milliliters, it's possible that the reflex will actually force the opening of the internal sphincter. All right, now 18.6 starts our uh, main talk about homeostasis and why it's essential and how the urinary system plays a role in this in three different ways. Um, so uh, there are three types involved, uh, the fluid balance, electrolyte balance, and the acid-base balance, and these are all vital to life and involves extracellular fluid, which is fluid outside of the cell, and intracellular fluid, so fluid inside of the cells. Fluid balance is when the amount of water you gain is equal to the amount you lose. Uh, this requires regulation of the content and distribution of water in the ECF, or extracellular fluid, and the ICF, intracellular fluid. Uh, the cells and tissues, they cannot transport water, so we rely on a concentration gradient mechanism we know as osmosis to keep ions in balance. Now, electrolytes, remember, are ions that are released through the dissociation of inorganic compounds, and they're named this way because they can conduct an electric current. Uh, th this involves balancing the rates of absorption across the digestive tract with rates of loss at the kidneys. So there's balance when there's no net gain or loss of any ion, and the two we're primarily going to talk about are sodium and potassium. Now, acid-base balance, uh, this involves the production of hydrogen ions. And if the production of hydrogen is equal to the loss, then we have balance. And the pH of body fluids remains within a normal limit. It's generally about 7.35 to 7.45. 
the prevent preventing reduction of pH is difficult due to the normal metabolic reactions that we have because they generate a variety of acids on a regular basis. Uh, the kidneys and lungs play key roles in maintaining the acid base balance of body fluids and we'll talk a little bit about that here soon. Now just to mention a little bit about the ECF and ICF, these fluid compartments. The ICF contains about 60% of the total body water and the ECF contains the rest, which is about 40%. There is exchange between the two, but they retain their own distinctive characteristics. <clears throat> so this balance is normally maintained by just general eating, drinking, and metabolic generation. Uh, so normal consumption basically of food and water. Now, we're going to talk more about blood pressure now and osmosis in maintaining fluid and electrolyte balance in 18.7. And you may hear something called a fluid shift, and this is just water movement between the ECF and ICF. Uh, if the ECF becomes hypertonic relative to ICF, water is going to move from the ICF to the ECF or from inside the cell to the outside. If the opposite happens and the ECF becomes hypotonic relative to ICF, uh, water will move from the extracellular fluid into the cells and then would increase the volume. So hopefully you remember this, these uh, terms. Uh, it's all osmosis and uh, we can discuss this a little more in class if need be. Now electrolyte balance is important because the total electrolyte concentrations affect the water balance overall. And there's a variety of cell functions that require a balance in these electrolytes. So uh, generally, they result from uh, sodium gains and losses. And then potassium problems are less common, but they are more dangerous. So these are the two we're going to talk about in detail. Now, the rate of sodium uptake is directly related to the amount of sodium in the diet. Uh, loss is going to occur mainly in the urine and through perspiration. The rate of absorption along the distant convoluted tubule is regulated by aldosterone levels, that hormone we uh, mentioned in the previous lecture. And what that hormone is going to do is stimulate sodium ion reabsorption as needed to maintain the balance. Uh, generally speaking, potassium balance uh, concentrations are very low anyway in extracellular fluid. Uh, potassium excretion will increase when the sodium ion concentration declines and then um, as the ECF potassium concentration rises. Uh, this is also regulated by aldosterone by stimulating the excretion of potassium as needed. 18A talks about acid base balance and a couple of buffer systems that try to keep our pH um, maintained properly. And so the pH of normal fluids, like I said, ranges from 7.35 to 7.45. That's not a very big range. Uh, variations will produce acidosis and alkalosis. Uh, carbonic acid is going to be the most important substance affecting the pH, and we'll talk a little bit more, that, more about that in a second. Uh, metabolic acids that are produced include products of metabolism such as lactic acid and ketone bodies. And there are some buffer systems that we're going to briefly mention. They consist of a weak acid and a weak base to basically neutralize the pH of the fluid. So carbonic acid. In solution, carbon dioxide reacts with water and that's how we get carbonic acid. And it's a dissociation of carbonic acid that releases hydrogen ions. And there's an inverse relationship that exists between the concentration of CO2 and pH. If you increase carbon dioxide, then the result is going to be pH going down and becoming more acidic. Now, the buffer systems involved that regulate uh, pH or acid base balance include three main ones. There's a protein buffer system, uh, which includes the initial, final, and R groups of the components of amino acids respond to changes in pH by accepting or releasing hydrogen ions. Uh, we get a little bit of help with that from blood plasma proteins and hemoglobin in the RBCs. And they're just going to prevent drastic changes basically in the blood pH. The carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system prevents pH changes due to metabolic acids in the extracellular fluid, so the ECF. And then your phosphate buffer system is important in preventing pH changes in the ICF or intracellular fluid. And so as long as you know where the buffers play a role, that's uh, the main concern here for your understanding. All right, now how is the respiratory system and how are the kidneys helping compensate for some of these things? The lungs help regulate pH by affecting the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system. And changes in the respiratory rate can raise or lower the pressure due to uh, the carbon dioxide in the fluid. Uh, the kidneys vary the rate of hydrogen ion secretion when necessary to maintain a pH balance and the bicarbonate ion reabsorption depending on the pH of the extracellular fluid itself. So that's how the respiratory and renal um, areas will help compensate for a pH change 
as needed. Uh, finally, some age-related effects. Uh, it's usually going to be the kidney function and the micturition reflex that are mostly affected as we age in the urinary system. So I am just going to uh, list them off for you. Uh, loss of functional nephrons play a role in these problems, reduce glom glomerular flotation rate. Um, reduced sensitivity to ADH, uh, problems with the micturition reflex usually develop in men whose prostate gland may be inflamed. Um, declining body water content, loss of mineral content, and disorders that affect either fluid, electrolyte, or acid-base balance. And so most of these problems uh, over aging is kidney related. All right, and uh, just remember that the urinary system is one of several body systems involved in waste excretion. Uh, so on page 637, check out that system integrator. There is a lot of effects of the urinary system on others as well as vice versa. So take some brief notes on that, and I mean brief, of anything that we didn't talk about in the notes or you haven't really ever heard of before. And uh, then we are done with the Chapter 18 video lectures. Uh, have a good day, and I'll see you guys next time.